Hi, welcome back to Jason Live. My name is Haley Nelson, and we are back with our STEM career series where we learn about careers in science, technology, in technology, engineering, and math from role models in those fields. Now, today's role model is Dr. Meg Lauman. Meg is a conservation biologist who has spent her career exploring the canopies and conserving forests all over the world. And she spends so much time up in the treetops, she has been called the mother of Canopy Research, and my favorite, Her Highness Canopy Meg. We are going to learn all about our STEM role model and more when we connect with Meg in just a few moments. But first, I want to remind you all that this event is live and interactive. So if you're joining us from the Jason Learning website, there is a box right below this window where you can ask questions. Uh, also, you can give us a tweet at hashtag Jason Live. We're hoping to get as many of you involved as possible. So listen for your name, listen for your question. Right now, it's time to say hello to Meg. Hi there. Thanks for joining us. Hey, it's great to be here. I'm really excited to talk to all of these cool students out there. Well, let's jump right in. We've got a bunch of questions already in and already coming in. Um, so let's start with the basics. What, what is an ecologist? Sure. An ecologist is really what I call a detective of the planet because we have to figure out how ecosystems work, how all of those beautiful natural systems operate, what things live in them, how those things interact, and now, most important, how do we keep them healthy? Forests, streams, mangroves, coastlines, oceans, all have ecologists that try to figure out how those systems work. Well, we have a comment coming from Sofia Flores from Congressional. She says, how does your job impact the world? Oh, wow, that's a cool question. Thank you for asking. So I am technically an arbornaut. An astronaut studies outer space. An arbornaut studies the tops of trees. So my impact on the world starts with looking at forests. And I'm especially interested in the tops of trees because that's where millions and millions of creatures live and all of the most productivity in the world goes on in the treetops, in the foliage. So how I impact the world is, number one, I spent a long time inventing tools to explore up there. And number two, I spent a lot more time trying to figure out who lives up there, everything from sloths to koalas to little teensy insects. And number three, now I spend a whole lot of time trying to save forests around the world because in my lifetime, about 50% have been cut down. So that's a pretty urgent job. Jill is wondering, why do you build walkways in the canopy instead of on the ground? Yeah, that's a great question. And we used to use ropes, we still do, to climb trees one at a time. I have my helmet here that I use when I climb a tree with a rope. And um, the reason we invented walkways way back in 1985 was then you can take 10 or even 20 people in the canopy at once, maybe a whole class. And so that's really important. And we do that to study what lives in the top of the tree because it's really different from the bottom. And guess what? Sometimes in some forests, it's, they're so sensitive that when you step on the roots of trees, it's almost more dangerous than if you build a little trail in the top of the tree and you're not crushing the roots all the time when you walk in the forest. So treetop walks are really good for research, really good for fun, and also good for education. And I, I love them. <laughs> I, I've had the, uh, the wonderful opportunity to work with Meg up in those treetops, and it's an experience nobody would ever forget. It um, is fun. Michaela Boda and Maya have two different questions that are similar. Um, Michaela wants to know if you have found any new species of animal while doing your job, and Mia or Maya wants to know if you found any new species of flower. Oh, cool. Yes, I did find a new species of vine in Belize. Believe it or not, when we did Jason 5, way back when, in the other generation of Jason, and of course vines have flowers, just like trees, um, and we actually found one of the coolest things I ever discovered was a new beetle. I have it here. I'll show you. Um, and this was during Jason 10 in the Amazon. Don't get too excited because it's just a brown beetle, but guess what? It's one of the few insects that eats 
bromeliad tanks. And when we found this during the Jason project in the Amazon, we put it on the internet and let students name it. So that was really fun. So those are just a few different kinds of discoveries. I've never discovered a mammal or a bird. Those are much less likely to be discovered because they're bigger and people tend to see them from the ground. So they've explored and discovered a lot of the larger creatures in the rainforest canopy, but the smaller ones are still ready to be discovered. There's still time. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, let's see, we've got, uh, I think this is Marie Walden, Cal Marie Walden, says, Hello, Canopy Meg. I'm a student at California Elementary middle and slash middle school and want to know if you have ever come in contact with anything dangerous or even life-threatening while doing this occupation. Oh, cool. Absolutely. I must admit, um, there are actually fewer things to worry about in the canopy than on the forest floor. Most of the poisonous snakes are on the forest floor and a lot of the stinging creatures. But in the canopy, you do have to watch out for wasp nests or stinging ants that crawl up and down the tree trunk. So there's a little bit of careful looking before you put your rope in the tree and before you climb up um, and get up into the treetops. So those are little things to watch out for. Uh, I will also say that in general, the biggest danger is ourselves. So I'm always careful to use safety, just like riding a bike. You've got to remember to clip your harness. You've got to put your helmet on. It's really important to wear a helmet. And my only accident that I did write about in my book called Life at the Treetops was when I forgot to clip on going down and I did fall about 15 feet. So human error it might be the most dangerous part of canopy work, just like it is everywhere else. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> and we have a, a question from Drew at JCD STEM. What is your favorite ecosystem and why? Oh my gosh. Well, my favorite ecosystem obviously is rainforest because they're so alive and vibrant. And as far as what is my favorite rainforest in terms of a location, I guess I would give two answers if I may. I love the Australian rainforest because that was the first place where I learned how to go to the canopy. And because I was one of the first people to explore the canopy, all of those Australian trees are near and dear to my heart. And um, But if I were to say to Drew or anybody else, you know, the best and coolest rainforest for you to go to would have to be the Amazon. And that's because it's still the biggest remaining tropical forest and probably the most important for your health. So seeing all those monkeys and knowing that jaguars live there and seeing these incredibly big capuck trees and big trees in the Amazon is a really, really amazing experience. I hope everybody gets to go at some point I in their lives. Do. That would be so yeah. wonderful. If not in person, at least virtually. <laughs> exactly. And we've got three similar questions that are all about which forests you work in. Cameron from uh, Cameron G from a STEM asks, where do you work most often? Uh, Jeremy Beckinger wants to know, have you visited Brazilian rainforests or a forest in the U.S.? And Jacob Wilson wonders, have you visited other countries to go to different forests? Okay, so we'll do a little geographical tour. So where am I working right now? I have two new projects, which is kind of cool. One is in Bhutan. Maybe students will have to look on the map, but it's next to Nepal. It's over there north of India, and we're building a canopy walkway there, which is really exciting. Another is in Malaysia, where we're going to be doing some biodiversity surveys in the canopies and also creating a walkway. So those are two new parts of the world that we really are excited about because conservation is so important in some of these countries that are just starting to develop their forest parks and uh, reserves. I have been to Brazil. I've been up uh, the Amazon River, of course. Most of my Amazon work is in Peru, which is next to Brazil, but I have worked a little bit in southern Brazil and had some 
fun projects around Bahia where there's some really neat epiphytes in the trees, which are air plants. Um, and I've worked in the U.S. Somebody said, have I worked in the U.S.? I've actually worked on the canopies in Massachusetts and in North Carolina and my long-term state of Florida. And believe it or not, we still don't know much about the canopies of North America. In fact, we're just starting a new project here in the Redwoods, the tallest trees in the world, and we don't know anything about what lives up there. So that's going to be pretty exciting. Uh, I've been to a lot of countries. If kids want to go on my website, which is www.canopymeg, you can probably see a variety of projects in different places from uh, Cameroon, Africa, to Ethiopia, to India, to Western Samoa, which is an island in the Pacific. So all the forests of the world need their canopy study, but there aren't too many canopy researchers. Maybe some of the students listening can become biologists with me. Well, I have a question here from a teacher who has some really neat ideas here. This is Lydia from Wyoming. And this question is a little bit more in depth. She teaches STEM students and she is, um, like you, she says, I've struggled most of my life with the hurdles of being a woman in several predominantly male fields. Uh, I try every day to make sure my female students recognize their own self-worth and gifts as they make their way toward entering the big world. Some days it's truly a struggle. So they're all wondering, watching right now, and she thought perhaps you'd be able to explain a little bit about actually the, the materials we choose when we buy things. and. Um, and she's talking specifically about the, the trees in the forest and the importance of which materials we choose and the processes we use to, um, to do that for our everyday manufacturing. Right. Yeah. So, you know, that's a great, great thought because the most important thing that is destroying the rainforest right now is American shoppers. We buy more things and we throw them out and then we buy stuff again. And sometimes we buy things and we don't know where it's come from. So I think if we become better shoppers and consumers, as they call it, we could really help save the rainforest. So there are a lot of things people can do. They can, for example, adults should buy coffee that's grown in the shade of the forest, not in cleared areas of sun. It's called shade-grown coffee. You should always buy fruits that come from sustainable farms if they're tropical fruits like bananas and not from places where they're clearing the forest to make the farms all the time. Here's a huge one, but palm oil, this crazy thing, you should maybe Google that palm oil and look it up, but it's in shampoo, it's in plastics, it's in cooking supplies, and palm oil is really causing the rainforests of Asia to be cut down. And if we can switch away from using this absolutely dreadful material in all of our products, then we can really help save the rainforest. And the same thing goes for timber, buying timber that has certified, uh, that it has not been part of a tropical deforestation project. Hopefully it's probably good to buy timber from plantations grown in North America because then you know it's safe. Um, all of these things are a little complicated, but students are great to do this homework. And maybe you could start a pro program in your school to advise local stores about making sure they don't put products in that come from tropical rainforests. I think that would be great. Or if they do put products from tropical rainforests, make sure they're really sustainable and they're harvesting them really carefully. That sounds like a great project. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. homework for everyone, but a good, good bit of homework. <laughs> Change in the world homework. That's good. Um, Jill wonders, who do you collaborate with when you design canopy walkways? So I actually started a company in the U.S. when I first built canopy walkways, and I needed someone that was really good with ropes. I needed a carpenter, and I needed an engineer to measure, and I needed what's called an arborist, somebody who takes tools up into the treetops and trims branches and looks at how tough and healthy the branches are and basically is an expert on tree health. So with about four or five people, 
we can build a canopy walkway. And if it's a bigger walkway, maybe we need two carpenters instead of one. So that's kind of how we've approached building these walkways is just getting a variety of people together that all are okay in a harness dangling from a branch. And uh, my job, of course, as the scientist is to try to pick the locations where we can do the research that we need to. Maybe one canopy walkway is really getting built to look at certain kinds of bird nests. So we want to design things very carefully. And maybe another one is designed so that we can look out over the canopy of a valley somewhere. So then we have to think about how to make the platforms and put them in the right place. Um, but they're really a great tool for our research and they're so new. Studying the canopy is really very brand new. You know, we went to the moon in the 1960s. We developed scuba gear in the 1950s, but we didn't develop canopy walkways till the 1980s. So canopy research is a very new exploration. So many different disciplines. Yeah. We have another question. What school subjects do you apply the most in your career? Wow. Whoa. That's a very great question. Probably playing on the playground. <laughs> you know, teamwork is so important. Learning how to work with others, I find as I get bigger projects, is really more important than I ever realized. We no longer have scientists that work in a lab by themselves with a test tube and crazy hair like Einstein or something. So it's always a team. And as far as the technical subjects that I use, it's really important to learn natural history. You might learn about the plants and the birds and the insects of your neighborhood, but that helps your eyes and your ears develop really good skills with your five senses. And then you can apply it if you go to the Amazon or you go to Asia with me on a canopy walkway. So learning the natural history is really important. Believe it or not, math is great because you need to be able to sample. You need to pick how many insects do I need to measure in order to see how big they are or how many leaves do I need to sample to know how much is the average damage that the caterpillars are causing. So math is really handy too. And then it doesn't hurt to have some skill in photography and in journaling, taking good notes. And believe it or not, two things that surprise me that I use a lot. One is writing and the other is public speaking, learning how to tell a story and how to get up in front of a group and explain your work is in really important in science. So maybe being on the debate team or maybe being part of the school yearbook to learn how to write and edit would be good skills to have along the way. Well, you've well, got... You've got is certainly a, a very infectious passion for what you do. So I can, I don't know if that's a, 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 a something that has come from just right out of you or if you had to do a lot of practice, but you're right, public speaking seems to be the way, I mean, I'm on board. I'm on board with you. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you a story. When I was in graduate school, that means I was 20 years old, I was so scared to talk to a microphone like this right now that I used to throw up in the bathroom before I had to give a report in front of my class. I was so shy and I had to practice. Pra I never did do public speaking in school. I wished I had been on the debate team, but I was too scared to join it. And so I had to practice, practice, practice. So that's why I always tell students, the more you can practice, especially girls, because I think there's still a lot of data that show women are don't talk in the boardroom and women tend to not be the more outspoken. And I sure was one of those shy girls. So I think it's great if you can just get those little skills along the way in the school uh, system. All right. Well, we're going to go to a question from Ben who wants to know about air plants. Oh, yay. Okay. So as a canopy scientist, I always see this amazing extra layer of biodiversity in the trees, which is called epiphytes or air plants. And those could be bromeliads, they could be orchids, which is, by the way, the biggest group of flowering plants in the world. It could be ferns, even cactus live in the tops of trees because the very tops of trees is quite dry. And so it's an extreme environment where cactus do really well. And then there are the littler things like mosses and lichens. So this whole layer, about two thirds up 
the treetops is really full of plant life, but in those plants live a lot of cool creatures too. So the epiphytes are very important for maintaining a lot of species on the planet, some of which never come to the forest floor. Do you know like little poison dart frogs lay their eggs sometimes up in bromelia tanks? And that's an amazing thing. And other things live in these bromelia tanks that never go back down to the forest floor. So those are pretty important and really amazing lifestyles in the canopy. Uh, I have two questions about the frog behind you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, it's kind of my mascot in my office. You know what this is? Maybe some students can shout it out in their classroom, but this is the cane toad from Australia. And it's kind of my reminder. You know, I mentioned I worked in Australia as my first rainforest. Well, while I was working in Australia, they had a sugarcane weevil that killed the sugarcane. So to the best of their knowledge, they thought, wouldn't it be great if we bring in a toad that maybe would eat the enemy, the grubs, that were going to kill the sugarcane. So they brought this cane toad in, but guess what? It couldn't reach the top of the sugarcane. The grubs were on the ground and the sugarcane was six feet off the ground. So the cane toad reproduced, it became an invasive species in Australia and has cost millions of dollars. So it's my reminder to my students that even though it's kind of cute, there are these things that humans do. We have to be awfully careful we don't export plants to the wrong place or even bring insects in our luggage or in this case, let toads out in countries where they might kill native animals and do bad things. Um, I don't have one here, but another example is the Burmese python in Florida. I was working in the Everglades to try to help remove what we now think are 100,000 pythons wriggling around the Everglades because some kid or family let their pythons out of their home aquarium when they grew too big. So again, we have to be really careful as human beings not to let mother nature loose in the wrong place. So that's my little mascot. <laughs> I've got a great idea. Field, field trip. Field trip. We field trip. Field trip. I think so. I love that. <laughs> uh, there are a couple of questions here. Do you use a microscope in the treetop? Um, and what kind of other equipment do you use? And that's from Rohan and uh, a couple of other schools. And if you use other instruments, what do you use them for? Okay, cool. So right behind me, maybe you can see my microscope. It's got a little plastic cover on it. Um, but I use my microscope in my office, but not in the treetops, and that's because it's pretty delicate. Um, I actually use my microscope sometimes to study things like this. This is about a thousand times bigger than it really is, but it's the cutest little thing called a water bear or a tardigrade that lives in the treetops. And we need, of course, a microscope to be able to identify them, to even find them in a drop of water. In the canopy and the cool thing about these guys is they're everywhere there are millions and we never even knew it until we started looking at drops of water in the treetops even the trees of Kansas we found eight new species but I need that microscope to work on things that are small that live in the canopy and so that's important you know the teeny things tend to be the ones we oftentimes overlook but maybe they're really important and these guys are the extremophile creatures that have gone to outer space and they've gone into hot springs so we're really interested in how do they get between trees they can't fly so how is it that they're all over the world in different forest treetops we don't know the answer to that yet um, when I go into the canopy, I take a camera, I take a notebook, I take usually a bucket with plastic bags because a lot of times I sample leaves. I'm really interested in how much insects eat in the canopy and I'm really kind of curious, you know, a tree can't run away like a jaguar can. So how come the insects don't eat the tree up 100%? Because it can't escape. So I'm always trying to figure out how trees become so strong and keep themselves from being eaten. So I sample the leaves 
and then I take little jars with me like these because I need to sample the insects as well. And then I try to do research on maybe the chemistry of the leaves, maybe the toughness of the leaves, different kinds of things that allow the tree to protect itself. So that's my detective work. And I don't need too many pieces of equipment for that because a lot of things I do back in the laboratory when I come home from the field. Eli wants to know what you do on a daily basis. Okay, so I go on a field trip, say um, next week I'm going to New Zealand. So I might be sampling some trees in New Zealand and that'll be great. So right now I'm packing and I'm trying to figure out what I need to take. But then I'll come back from a field trip and I'll come into my office, which you see behind me. I have to clean my equipment, I have to take really good care of my ropes, I have to then use the microscope maybe to identify some species, get my computer out and process my data. I might have leaf measurements, I might have numbers of leaves that have been damaged, I might have numbers of beetles that were all feeding on one species of tree. There's all kinds of different questions. Sometimes I might have water bears to look at. Other times I might even have traps. We sometimes do live traps like we do camera traps to look at the number of mammals that are in the forest all night long and we have to count those. So there's a lot of different questions that we might have to work back in the office. So I'll come in the office after I'm in the field and then I'll have to write too. I have to write my reports to the funding grants that I receive for the project. I might have to write a publication. Maybe I have to write a story in a magazine for kids so they can learn about how I do my research. Um, and so all kinds of things have to happen. And I think probably I'm in the forest maybe a quarter of the year and I'm in my office maybe a half of the year and then I'm traveling to give talks or go to conferences or visit with my science colleagues another quarter of the year. But I still like to eat and cook and read a book or something. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you were talking about uh, you know visiting with kids, maybe writing for them. Let's talk about maybe when you were a kid. Let's shift and talk about how you got to where you are today. We have a comment that says, uh, when did you fall in love with nature? Oh, my gosh. So I think about age three. Now, you guys will probably laugh, but, you know, when I grew up, there wasn't internet there wasn't video and so we had a movie theater that was really far away from where I lived and so we hardly ever went to the movies so I did play outside a lot and I loved trees and I built little tree forts so that kind of made me a nature nut. It, I was kind of my friends made fun of me because I liked to bird watch and no one else did. I'm a little embarrassed but I'm going to show you something brand new. This is a little book that I just published. It's on Amazon.com. And those are my illustrations at age nine. But I wrote this book because I loved birds so much. And so I just published it about two weeks ago. It's called the it, Through the Year with Gertrude Grossbeek. <laughs> and, and all my friends made fun of me because I like to bird watch. But this was something my mom found it in her closet, this little manuscript that I'd done when I was nine years old and finished, I think, when I was 10. And so now I just published it because maybe some students out there like to draw. I obviously love to draw. And maybe they, too, have little stories about nature. And so this was kind of my beginning. And uh, even in this page, this is really embarrassing, but I'll see if I can show you. Um, here I am. I'll sort of hold that up. But that black and white picture is me in fifth grade with my wildflower collection in the New York State Science Fair. And seriously, there were 500 guys and me. And I was so shy. And they all had volcano experiments. Remember those things? Vinegar, pop, poof. <laughs> And I had this wildflower collection and I got a second prize. It was, I was like too shy to even say thank you when they gave me this little plastic trophy. But, you know, it just made me think, oh my gosh, maybe there is some way that girls can be in science. So that was pretty life changing for me. That's awesome. I love all of your stories. Um, 
<laughs> okay, so what kind of influence did your parents have on you? Which you just kind of, that, it's amazing that, that, you know, your mom kept that and found that. And um, what made you want to do what you want to do? And also, did anyone inspire you from either? I, from you know, so my parents were so kind. They knew nothing about nature. My dad never even went camping. And it was, it's so funny because they did funny things like they would let the, they would stop the car on the side of the road when I saw a wildflower that I really wanted and they would let me get out of the car and collect it. And my mom would get up at five in the morning with me and I had my little pair of binoculars that cost a dollar and I'd go out and look at these, you know, grow speaks or something. Um, so they were just so kind to allow my addiction to nature. And I think a turning point for me was I did go to a camp in middle school that had a lot of nature study and I finally met a few kids that like to go bird watching and a few kids that like to collect wildflowers. So having a few friends to share nature with was very critical for me and I think that was great. And again, my parents were supportive in that. They didn't say, oh, you know, girls don't do that and that kind of thing. This is amazing. The teachers will probably have this in common with me as some of them anyway, but I never had a woman science teacher my whole life. I had all male teachers for biology, for chemistry. When I went to college, all the professors were men in science. So I didn't have a role model female, but I looked and read little biographies from the library. And I loved, of course, Rachel Carson, who was a lady that discovered that pesticides killed all the songbirds in North America in the 50s and also created chemicals in our water that hurt a lot of people's health. So I really thought she was a hero. And I also love Harriet Tubman, who was this African-American lady that helped the black people, uh, slaves, walk north in the Underground Railway, it was called, in the Civil War. She took them at night from Georgia, North Carolina, up to New York State and New Hampshire. And she did it by feeling the moss on the tree trunks. And she knew if the moss was on the north side, she was heading north. I just feel like she's maybe one of the coolest naturalists. And now, today, they're gonna, I think they're going to put her on a $20 bill. I thought, you know, for the longest time, nobody had ever heard of her except me, it seemed like. But now she's becoming really famous as an early African-American role model. So I'm really proud that Harriet Tubman was part of my inspiration as a child. Well, we've got some questions about uh, where you went to school. So Gabby and Fiona, um, they want to know what did you study in college and, um, and to, to do your job today? And I think based on what you said a few minutes ago, Blue Eyes White Dragon wants to know why did you go to a mostly male school? <laughs> It's a great question. You know, I went to Williams College. I was the second class of women. I only applied to colleges that had a forest. This was so crazy, but I looked through all the books about colleges, and I wanted to go to a college that had its own forest, because I really did have that passion about trees and learning about forests that I developed at age three with my little tree forts in elementary school and everything. So Williams College had a forest. I didn't really understand the gender thing. I was just happy that they said we accept women. I got there. I was so shocked because there were less than 20% women. Um, I must admit, I thought about majoring in geology because it seemed like you could really get a lot of jobs if you worked for oil companies or drilling or something. And then the professor, the senior professor said, no, girls can't do geology. That's only for guys. I was, again, too shy to say, oh my gosh. So I quickly switched from geology to biology because I knew that rocks and, you know, like geology and biology were important to forests. So I became a true biology major. And that was how come I ended up at a school that had mostly men. Um, but it wasn't kind of, I, it wasn't the social aspect. It was really all about the forest. <laughs> well, we have a third grader named Kate McDonald asking you, how do trees from your hometown, so I guess when you were young, um, when uh, at that age where you fell in love with trees, how do they compare to trees from the rainforest? Oh, wow, what a great question. And that's kind of inspired my whole life's work is in Elmira, New York, where I grew up, upstate New York, 
all the trees lose their leaves in the winter because it's so snowy and they turn red and they turn yellow and they really look pretty for about a month. So when I first went to the tropics, I couldn't believe that it was always green in the treetops, that there was always a leaf on most of the trees. So my first big question in the tropical research world was, how long does a leaf stay on the tree? I thought it would be this really easy thing to do. I even thought I could get a hammock and lie down in the understory and lie there all day and the leaves would fall on me and I could just measure them. Unfortunately, or fortunately, my advisor of my research in the tropical forest said, no, I think you're going to have to climb the tree to answer this question. So that's what I did. And it turns out, if you can believe this, some leaves live 20 years in the tropics. So that's really a long time compared to six months in my forest of upstate New York. And of course, learning about these leaves then led me to look at how many things were eating them and how many things were living in them. And that's when I got so interested in all the other critters that were up in the treetops. So one thing kind of led to the other. But those trees in upstate New York really did make me think hard about how different they are from the tropics. Whoa, 20 years? <laughs> Crazy, isn't it? Probably that's longer than most of the students watching this broadcast. <laughs> that's that's very true. Well, we have a question uh, from a person <laughs> and from uh, Fazy Rain. Did you ever get to a point where you just wanted to give up? If not, have you had any big struggles in your job? And Fazy Rain has something similar, saying, "Did anybody ever tell you that you couldn't do it or that you would fail?" Yes, all the time. <laughs> Um, so I did reach points where I thought I should give up. Uh, two things. One is, of course, as a woman in science, I was always told that I shouldn't be doing this. I, when I started my graduate work, the head of the department said, why are you doing this PhD thing? Because you'll only get married and have children. And I was, again, too shy to say any kind of a reasonable answer, but it made me quietly determined, even if I wasn't very vocal about it. Um, and I got a lot of situations always where I was the only girl on expeditions, and it was obvious that I wasn't too welcome at certain uh, expeditions because all the guys kind of wanted it to themselves. So there was that um, constant reminder that maybe this was not the thing that I should be doing. And the second thing is now, of course, it's a very depressing world to be studying forest conservation, especially rainforests, when they are being cut down so quickly and so absolutely destructively. So I feel worried for my children. I feel concerned about trying to create solutions really fast. And so that makes me a little sad sometimes, but it also makes me determined and enthusiastic because we can't just wait around. It's not like studying Shakespeare or something where I might be able to analyze it in a hundred years and it will still be there. I have to really work on it today and not tomorrow. We have Kay Dukoff who says, I really love how you represent that women can do anything as good as men. What gave you the confidence to go into an almost all male career? Uh, I guess I thought trees were so cool and it didn't dawn on me that most people who study trees were foresters and they're all guys. If they were at least when I was a kid. And so that kind of, I think I was so naive. So maybe that was a blessing that I was so naive. And I think what drove me a lot through my career was actually being a mom. And I was a single mom for a long time. Uh, I have two boys. So I was kind of lucky that they both liked to be outside with me. And they were always my research associates. Um, we wrote a book together. Um, actually, it's translated in Chinese. Here it is. It's kind of hard to read. But the cool thing is we taught, had a lot of adventures and stories. And I feel so strongly about forest conservation as a parent almost more than as a scientist. So I think by having my kids uh, and investing in their childhood helped me think a lot about the importance of number one, making science fun, and number two, really having some success with conservation because 
the kids that are watching this won't stay alive if we cut our forest down. None of us will stay alive if we cut our forest down. So we need to protect them, period. And we need to plant trees and we need to teach other people and especially kids about the importance of forests. Well, that, that person who said, why are you getting a PhD when you know you're going to get married and have kids? So you ended up doing both? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So go girls and boys. I always tell people I am an advocate for boys too. As a mother of two boys, I have to support both genders, but I do think it's still a little tougher for girls. And if you're listening and you are a girl, it looks great out there, but there still is what people call this glass ceiling means it's kind of invisible. And sometimes you bump your head on something because they make it a little harder for girls to succeed than boys. So I would just say keep at it and also support each other. Um, I get a lot of support from other girls and women that have jobs, single moms, or that are now scientists. We have to work together and support each other. JCD STEM says they have just a big comment that says you are very inspirational. And Lacey Green wants to know, do you want females to stand up for themselves and start doing harder jobs? I think uh, women can do things better. That's my philosophy. I think somehow women are really great in terms of being organized, uh, dividing your brain and uh, doing multitasking. And so um, I think women should do whatever inspires them to do it. I love cooking. I love being at home. I love cleaning my house, believe it or not, because it's kind of fun. But I also think that uh, I love being a scientist. And actually, I have a project right now in Ethiopia working with priests, and they like the fact that I'm female. They trust me a lot more. So for once in my career, I'm actually in, in advantaged by being female because I've developed the trust of the local partners in a project to save their forests. Wow. I, I didn't know that. That's kind of amazing. Yeah. Uh, it, well, Carrie S. wonders, why do you think your job is better than the rest? Would you rather do something else? No, I don't think I'll trade it. Sometimes I think, you know, one of my tree friends when I was little was my neighbor, a guy named Tommy Hilfiger, if you can believe it. And I think most of the kids know he became a fashion designer and his friend Betsy was my best tree fort uh, buddy. Um, and we're still best friends. And I laugh because Tommy now could probably afford to buy half the forests of the world, and I'm still trying to save them. So my only regret maybe is that I didn't invent something that really would have caught, created some revenue that would allow me to buy all the forests and save them. But I really love what I do, and I'm glad that I've been able to share it with my kids. I always think, you know, if I were a banker or some really well-paid doctor, I probably couldn't have brought my kids to work with me. <laughs> Yeah, you have such a cool story because it's it's just, you, you never could have planned it, but it was perfect. <laughs> that is true. I never could have planned it. You are so right. So my career advice for everyone is a lot of it's fate and chance. Sometimes you just don't know where it will lead to. Well, we've got some questions wondering about, uh, this is from Cameron and Anaheim. What do you do for fun and what do you do in your spare time? So I guess I mentioned a little, I do love to cook. I taught both of my boys to cook. Um, sometimes we get on Skype and we cook the same things in our kitchens because one is in Boston and the other one is here in California with me. So we kind of have fun with that. Um, I love to read. I love to read adventure books, not necessarily science books. I love to read about other women in science though. That's really fun. I do enjoy traveling, but when I go on a vacation, I kind Kind of sometimes love to go places where there aren't any trees. This is a big family joke because whenever I go on a vacation to some place that has forests, people always ask me to answer questions or maybe look at what the diseases are that are affecting their trees. So I love to go to the beach. I love to swim in the ocean and go snorkeling and do a few things that are really different from trees. No, it's all trees <laughs> all the time. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, we have two questions about if, if you want to be a conservation biologist, what do you recommend and what is your message if you want, uh, to students who want to follow your step, footsteps particularly? 
Right. So keep track of my websites, canopymag.com and treefoundation.org, which is my website that I do a lot of like forest conservation projects on. And I try to provide blogs and information about different things and different adventures. And obviously I've written some books that can provide those kinds of information like how did I ask the question? How did I make the solution? How did I answer it? To provide real studies, as we call them, to help kids and young people think through how we really do the science, not just the result, but actually the methods, the toolkit, as I mentioned, and how we solve it. And I would just say for anyone that might want to be a conservation biologist or a forest scientist, use your five senses, get out into nature, learn about everything from insects to sloths and um, someday you'll go to college and maybe you'll major in math and maybe you'll major in biology and maybe you'll even major in economics because you need to learn about how much a forest is worth so there's a lot of ways you can become a really good conservation biologist by in the end you'll work somewhere where you're part of a team so don't forget that playground play too <laughs> And maybe they'll grow up and be a zillionaire and buy all the forests. I hope for, so. That's <laughs> right. Fashion design is not you, so bad. You and can help no matter what you do. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Um, we have, uh, well, we've, we've talked about the past, so let's move on. Let's move forward. Um, Ansh wants to know, what are your plans for the future? So, oh, let's see, that's, that's uh, Rishita. And uh, another one is, uh, what are your goals for the future? Sure. Uh, so right now I'm working in about eight countries. My hope and goal is uh, that I want to save the force of Ethiopia. That's really critical to me right now because less than 5% remains in northern Ethiopia. In my project with priests, where the last Ethiopian forests are in the churchyard is really critical. I need to do that in five years. And if you go on treefoundation.org, you'll see the pictures of the stone walls we're building around these church forest yards. They're so awesome, so simple, and such a beautiful solution to keeping the cattle out and keeping the forest from shrinking. So that's important to me. And then setting up these canopy walkways in countries where people are learning, guess what? We can make money by saving our forests, not cutting them down, because we can create this thing called tourism in the forest. So I'm really uh, passionate about that. I want to write a few more children's books. I have another one that's for the kids in Ethiopia. Here it is in Ethiopian language, and here it is in American language, but getting the message across to different generations I find is really important, and I think getting the message to different kinds of people, not just to scientists. So I guess I have a lot to do. I think I need to live about 100 more years, but I'm excited to do all that, and I want to make sure that we not only work globally but act global locally so right now i'm also getting involved as i mentioned in some redwood forest conservation we hope to build a canopy walkway in redwoods in california because nobody knows much about them we know more about the amazon than we do about the redwoods so that's kind of a crazy little in your backyard detective work how abdiel is wondering how you feel when you're in the canopies Oh my gosh, it is so fun. I wish you would come with me. Maybe you can come someday to the Amazon. Every summer I take a group to the canopy, about 25 people, families, kids, whatever. You have to be seven. That's the youngest age, and I'm sure you're over seven. But it's life-changing. There's so much life. The oxygen is great, of course, and there's a lot to watch. There's a lot of new things that no one's ever seen before, so you feel very privileged and very humbled to be up there. Yeah, and it's pretty amazing. Here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show a picture. And Meg, you don't know I was going to do this, but here we go. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Yay, look at us from the Amazon. Oh, Haley, yes. that's so great. And there are tattoos there. And uh, and this is DC. He was he's uh, someone you met teaching a long, long time ago. Yep, we worked together 25 years. We met on Jason 5 set uh, in Belize. He was a teacher Argonaut from Minnesota, and uh, he still works with me in the rainforest, which is so great. 
Well, going, um, uh, going forward a little bit more, what careers, The Flash asks, what characteristics do you need in order to do this job? Um, probably a little bit of risk taking, uh, a little bit of adventure, but I think passion is a very important word. You mentioned that earlier, Haley, just feeling really strongly about solving some problems. Sometimes I think my middle name should be solution because all of these things from developing the tools to finding the bugs hidden in the leaves to saving the forest, they're all, they all require solutions. So I think that's a really kind of good mindset for you to have, not to drop things halfway through and pick something else up, but to see something through to solving it. Well, we have another question about your body of work. What piece of work are you most proud of? That's a question from Dartran. Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to cheat a little and say maybe two things. But my first public book called Life in the Treetops, I was proud of that because all the guys that were my colleagues told me that I shouldn't bother to write a book about being a woman in science. It, would, it was a really stupid thing to do and it wasn't gonna promote me or help me in any way. And it got a review in the New York Times book review, which is a very prestigious thing. So I was so proud of that. But my latest most, I think, pride is, believe it or not, this little children's book that you can get on amazon.com and it shows why trees are important. All the photos are ones that I took in Ethiopia. But for me now, I realize that by translating books into the language of the people whose forests are at risk, and even having this book in Chinese, you see, is so important. We can't go there and expect people to just listen to us in English. We have to really get with the local people and understand things from their eyes. So that's kind of my uh, feeling of what I need to do now. And so more projects like this and more opportunities to really um, get with people who are every day living and working in their own forests, I think is the best way that I can achieve some success. Meg, we have time for one more question and this comes from Audit who says, what steps should we take to save ecosystems? Wow, oh my gosh. So you're shopping. Don't forget what we talked about earlier to be really conscientious to buy sustainable products whenever you can. Your education, even reading books and sharing them, instead of buying people uh, video games for Christmas, maybe buy them a book about the rainforest, maybe make sure your libraries have those kinds of opportunities to really learn cool things about rainforests, and then making sure you talk to other people about it, your parents, your Boy Scout group, your Girl Scouts, maybe your, I was thinking I'd love to take a science booth to the Iowa State Fair next year, you know, going to places where maybe people need to learn about forests and why they keep us alive because a lot of people don't get the chance to learn as much as most of you kids get to learn in your school classroom. So we need to share the knowledge and um, maybe along the way you could make a little bug collection too like I have. <laughs> you know, learning about nature and studying wildflowers and insects and doing those things as part of your uh, growing up process is really going to give you a lot of preparation for being a good scientist. Woo! All right. I love you, Meg. <laughs> oh, thanks to everyone and good luck to all those great students out there. Well, unfortunately, we're all out of time. So thank you so very much for coming to share your story today. And I can't wait until the next time uh, we see what you're up to. Okay, that's a great pun. Thank you, Haley. <laughs> now, our next, our next event will be on November 17th, featuring STEM role model Dr. Eric Benbow. He's an ecologist, an entomologist, a microbial ecologist, and he studies microbiomes on our bodies and how they change after a person dies. So that is quite interesting and intriguing. Until then, for Jason Learning, I'm Haley Nelson, and we'll see you again on Jason Live.